Program Programming Coordinator at the Nantucket Athenaeum. It is my great pleasure to introduce Nancy Thayer and Maggie Shipstead this morning. One of my favorite parts of my job is to put authors on stage and hear them talk about writing. So for those of us that live on Nantucket, Maggie Shipstead's novel, Seating Arrangements, a thoroughly entertaining tale about island life and wasp culture, which around here is a phenomenon we like to call summer, feels an awful lot like home. Set on a fictional island called Waskeke, the story centers on the Van Meter family, who's getting ready to marry off daughter Daphne to young Skyon Grayson Duff. There are whale pants, cocktails, and boiled lobsters. There's even a dead whale that washes ashore. But the story is really about the patriarch Wynne, who despite a solid adherence to the wasp traditions and code that shelter him, and that provide a, a stiff kind of order to his world, still feels like an outsider searching for his place. Maggie grew up in Orange County, California. She's a graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop and a recipient of the Stegner Fellowship from Stanford University. Seating Arrangements, a bestseller published in 2012, was a final finalist for the Flaherty Dunnan First Novel Prize and the winner of the 2012 Dylan Thomas Prize. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, Tin House, VQR, Paris Review Daily, New Republic Book, and American short fiction, and the best American short stories. Her story, La Moretta, was published in VQR and was a 2012 National Magazine Award finalist for fiction. Nancy Thayer, who I am pleased to call a friend, I met eight, or I got to know eight years ago when I went to her house on Orange Street, a home she shares with her husband, Charlie Walter, since the early 1980s, and I was to interview her about her popular Hot Flesh Cub series for N Magazine. And for me, at least, there's always this tentative quality to the beginning of an interview. You're in someone's house, you're sitting on their couch, you're trying to keep your skirt from riding up while you're writing, where you're asking really pointed questions. And, uh, but with Nancy, it was not that way. She welcomed me in like an old friend and was and still is. Um, it's clear that she loves people and conversation and is masterful at putting people at ease. And I believe it's those same qualities that dry, draw readers to her work, an amazing 23 novels about family, relationships, and the bonds of friendship. Her latest heat wave just came out last week. So in that interview eight years ago, Nancy said, when I got my master's degree in 1966, I never read one thing by a woman writer. I remember thinking I want to write serious novels about everyday women in everyday life. Happily, in 2013, there are many, many women writers finding success, and I believe they have Nancy Thayer to thank in part. Nancy has a bachelor's and a master's degree in English literature from the University of Missouri at Kansas City. She was a fellow at the Breadloaf Writers Conference. She's lived on Nantucket year-round for 28 years with her husband, Charlie, and her daughter novel is novelist Samantha Wilde. So please join me in welcoming Nancy Thayer and Maggie Shipstead. Thank you, Amy. What a wonderful introduction. Hello, everybody out there. Hello, Maggie. Hello, Nancy. <laughs> I just met Maggie about 10 minutes ago, the real Maggie. Um, I read her book, Seating Arrangements, last summer, which you probably all read last summer, too. I have to say this is one of the most beautifully written books I've ever read. and. I'm, I'm, I'm astounded, I, and I think many of the critics are astounded, too, and maybe you, Maggie, are astounded at the reception you got. Are you astounded? Um, yeah, it's been, it's been such a relief, really. I think the, the month before it came out, um, I was house-sitting for my parents in San Diego, and it got two terrible reviews in the publishing magazines, Publishers Weekly and Kirkus Review. And so I just thought, this is going to be an unmitigated. It is on. Yeah. Closer. There we go. Um, so I just kind of thought, this is going to be an unmitigated disaster. 
everyone's gonna hate this book and I had all these anxiety dreams and um, but then after that when it came out and, and it was pretty well received every every little good thing that happened just felt like a relief and like it wasn't gonna be a disaster so I, I have been astonished it's been it's been really great let me ask you a question I know everyone asks um, especially about a first novel which is if you take writing courses, they say, write what you know. And obviously, if you have read Seating Arrangements, which is mostly from the point of view of the patriarch of a wealthy New England clan, and his name is Wynne, and he is not a completely likable fellow, I have to say. Um, in fact, well, we'll talk about the argument I got into my, with my daughter about when later. <laughs> but um, obviously, Maggie is not a male wasp patriarch, and she seems pretty likable. Or am I? <laughs> how did you how did you get into Wynne's point? How did you choose that point of view? Yeah, Wynne was really the starting point for the whole book. Um, and I'm not generally an adherent to the, the write what you know sort of dictum. Um, partly because, I, my, I mean, my counter little nugget, I guess, is write what you wonder about. And to me, it's more interesting to sort of explore something through writing about it than sort of... And I feel like, what do you actually ever really know, too, is part of it. Um, but this book started as a short story. I wrote it my first semester of grad school, which was almost seven years ago. And a friend of mine was actually here on Nantucket riding his bike, wearing tennis whites, swinging a tennis racket as he rode his bike, and was hit by a golf cart. And um, he called to sort of get some friendly commiseration and was telling me this whole story. And, and the guy driving the golf cart refused to apologize for hitting him, which if you've read the book is, is an incident in the book. And um, my friend was just so profoundly troubled by this lack of an apology. And it almost seemed like he couldn't believe the world was still spinning if this man won't apologize. And I just thought it was, it was so interesting. And I sort of started to wonder what it would be like to live your life with these rigid expectations for how other people would behave. And so he thought, he was getting sympathy and I was like taking notes on a legal pad and um, so I wrote a short story about this character Wynn Van Meter who's the father of the bride um, and the the book is set over a wedding weekend on sort of a thinly fictionalized Nantucket um, and I couldn't really make the short story work it was 15 pages long, and Wynn got hit by a golf cart, and he cooked lobsters, and he gave his daughter away. And um, somebody eventually just suggested, well, maybe there's too much there, maybe it should be a novella. And then I sort of had this whole sense of possibility, and really it was rooted in, in Wynn, and just, I felt like I had chemistry with this character, and I was interested in, in what he would be like if I could sort of spend more time with him. So. That's really how it started, just being interested in this kind of weird guy. <laughs> now, you came to Nantucket to write this book. I did, yeah. Did you, did you think, I'm going to Nantucket because that will help inspire my feelings for the book? Yeah, I'd, I'd only been here twice before, just for weekends. Um, and so I finished my master's degree, and then I decided it would be a great idea to winter over <laughs> and write this book. Um, so I was here from October 1st to June 1st in uh, 2008 to 2009. And um, yeah, in retrospect, that's probably more time than I needed to really get the local color <laughs> for the book, especially because it's set in June and I left on June 1st. So this is actually the first time I've ever been here in high season and it's kind of a revelation. <laughs> I sort of get it now. Um, but yeah, I, 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 for as quiet, I'm sure it's probably this way for you too, but it was so quiet, it was so helpful with getting work done because there's nothing else to do but write. And I was just here with my dog, 
and I didn't know anyone, and I never made any friends. <laughs> and I just, I wrote, and I'd take the dog for a long walk in the afternoon, and it seems like when Nat Philbrick was talking yesterday evening about how he walks his dog on the um, conservation land twice a day, and so now I think, in retrospect, everyone I was bumping into out there are writers <laughs> with their dogs. <laughs> That's probably true, yes, yes. So you left Nantucket, what, four years ago? Yeah. And you're from California. And did you go back to California? Yeah, I, um, I went back because I had a fellowship at Stanford. Um, and I, so I grew up in Orange County, and I never really felt at home there just didn't seem like my, my place or my people. I came to, to Massachusetts for college. Um, and so I lived there for five years and then I was in Iowa for two years and then went back to California. And when I left Nantucket, I had a complete first draft of seating arrangements. Um, and then I spent, I sent it, I very, you know, sort of confidently sent it to my agent and she called me and we had this two hour long phone conversation after which I had to go have a glass of wine <laughs> and have some lunch because it was sort of dawning on me just how much more work had to happen. So then took another year, um, my first year at Stanford to revise and get it ready and then we sold it and then it was two years between the sale and publication and now it's been out for a year. Why the title Seating Arrangements? Um, I can't really take credit for that. I actually called it Inside the Whale for a long time, but um, George Orwell has a very famous, to everyone except me, apparently, essay called Inside the Whale, so that had to go. Um, and uh, all the chapters have titles, and Seating Arrangements was one of the chapter titles, and so before my agent sent it to editors, we are sort of casting about for a title, and that's what she chose, and I think I think it was a really good um, impulse on her part because I think it's it's about sort of, the book is about social niceties and so there's that sense of seating arrangements but it's also sort of about who you sit next to through your life and um, so yeah, good for her. <laughs> <laughs> the main character in seating arrangements is a, is a patriarch, as I, as I said, named Wen and one of the things that fascinates me is that what drives Wynne is his deep, deep envy for a man much like him named Fenn. And um, the envy and the desire to get into the Pequod club, golf club, is so, is so uh, it's fiercely part of this man, Wynne, who has what it seems to me, everything in the world. He has a wife who loves him, he has healthy, two healthy daughters. Um, why, and Finn seems much more, he seems also of the same cast, but he seems a little more rational. Why did you name Finn, Finn? Um, I think Fenn was one of the, so actually before I started writing the book, I'm not actually sure why I did it, I started collecting names, particularly very sort of preppy, waspy names. Um, and I was at this sort of really old school resort in Rhode Island and they had a, a plaque of lawn bowling champions <laughs> starting in the 50s. And I was like writing down all these names and, um, Fen was one of them, but I like um, I like the sort of swampiness of the association, you know, like a, a Fen, and I like also just the clean kind of one syllable uh, quality it has. So I don't know. I mean, so there was nothing like these are kind of mirror images, maybe or anything. I I thought perhaps no. 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 But no. sure, actually, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, that was a calculated move on my part. Yeah. <laughs> this is another thing that Maggie does, and I don't know how she does it. She can describe a scene that is 
almost tragic. It is so, so sad. And at the same time, it's hysterically funny. Do you just do it? Or do you think you naturally are sort of sardonic or <laughs> sarcastic or? Um, yeah, I think I, I probably am naturally those things. It's just good sometimes and not great other times. Um, I found with my writing that humor sort of tends to creep in, um, whether or not I sort of set out to include it. And I, when I was writing this book, I never thought the word satire in my head. It was never really intended as a satire. But then when it came out and was called that, it was sort of like, oh, of course, it's obviously a satire. Um, but I think if I, if I had been purposefully writing a satire, it would have been much heavier. I mean, the, the um, comedic elements would have been heavier and more forced. So, I mean, I, I think it also is just partly has to do with what I like to read. And I, I like things that have humor in them. I think it can be kind of a relief and it's entertaining. I like to laugh, so. What writers do you read? Um, I read a lot of different ones. These days I'm doing a lot of reviewing, so I'm not really, I don't really have much free will as far as what I'm reading, but um, I like lots of older, you know, writers who are dead, like Evil and Wah. Um, I like this writer, Henry Green. Um, I like John Cheever, I like John Updike. Um, I like Alice Munro, who's alive. Um, <laughs> I like John Le Carre a lot, actually. Oh, I, I think he's an amazing stylist. Um, um, yeah, I, I like Michael Shabin. I like Jeffrey Eugenides. Michael Shabin, both of those writers, actually, I think are good examples of, of what I would aspire to do, which is that their books have a compelling story and are entertaining, but they're also stylistically interesting and beautiful, but the style is really in service of the story. Um, so, yeah. You're working on another book, or you have a new book coming out? Yeah, I'm, my second book comes out in April, um, and it's called Astonish Me. And so it's really different uh, from seating arrangements um, in pretty much every way, especially in tone. And there's no satire, it's quite earnest. Um, it's about ballet dancers, and, and it's almost melodramatic. It's meant to sort of feel like a ballet. And it, seating arrangements covers about three days, and Astonish Me starts in 1972 and goes through 2002, but is um, slightly shorter. And it's set in Paris and New York and Southern California, and basically it's a, a dancer in the core of sort of an American ballet theater. Um, who helps a Soviet star defect in 1975. And they have an affair and it ends badly and she stops dancing and moves to California and has a family. And um, her son ends up having a very serious talent for dance and so she gets sort of drawn back into the ballet world. Um, so it's really different. I am in the last round of edits right now with about uh, two weeks left on the clock, so I just want it to go away. <laughs> well, now I want to find out where you grow up, and I want to ask the question that sometimes people don't like to answer, but when did you know you wanted to write? And how did you get into, how did you get into this? It's incredible what you're doing. Um, I think my sort of path to being a writer was just a series of happy accidents, really. Um, I went to Harvard and I got there and I thought I was going to be a social anthropology major. But turns out you can't be very judgmental when you're a social anthropologist, so it didn't work. <laughs> um, so I just looking at the course catalog, all the courses I wanted to take were English classes. So I switched to English and then basically on a whim my sophomore year, I took a fiction writing workshop. Um, and I liked it and it went pretty well. And I've always been a reader, but I was never like a little kid who wrote stories or anything like that. Um, 
And then my junior year, Zadie Smith came and taught a workshop. And it was the first time she'd ever taught. And she's not sold on the concept of teaching at all. And she was, I think she was 30. And her first two books were out. And she was writing on beauty. Um, and so you had to apply to be in her workshop. So I applied. And then they posted the list of who got in. I went and I looked at the list. And I wasn't on it. And I sort of thought, oh, well, like, that was an interesting experiment, but I guess it's not meant to be. And then later that day, someone congratulated me, and I was just looking at the wrong list. And I think, I think if that person hadn't told me, I don't think I would have found out I was in her class, and I think I wouldn't have kept writing. Um, she, was, she was tremendously inspiring. She's so brilliant. Um, and she was really rigorous and kind of tough love, which, which worked well for me. Um, so I took her class and then my senior year I applied to write a creative thesis instead of an academic thesis. I wrote a collection of short stories, um, but still not with any intention. It just, I, I couldn't fathom sort of having enough to say about any one subject to fill a novel. It just seemed impossible. Um, so I graduated and I stayed in Boston and I was sort of adrift and I was living with friends. I was working at a law firm because if you're verbal, everyone says be a lawyer. And um, <laughs> I also basically on a whim, I applied to the Iowa Writers Workshop um, that year and, and I sort of assumed I wouldn't get in and I figured I would reapply the next year and I'd do my homework and I'd apply other places. Um, and then I got in and it surprised the living daylights out of me. And so I was like, okay, I guess I'll move to Iowa. And uh, it was really there, I think, that I started to feel that it was viable. Um, but it is such an uncertain profession. And, and after Iowa, I had a little bit of fellowship money, a little bit of savings. And that's when I came here. Um, and then since then, it's just kind of things have sort of kept working out. So I just figure I'll keep riding the wave. <laughs> I think you'd better keep riding the wave. I think it's, it's your, the quotes you have received. If you want to pick up any of her, well, her hardback or her paperback, she has quotes from the New York Times, from the Washington Post. I, don't, I bet the two people that, that gave her a bad review in Kirkus and PW have slipped their throats. I'm sure they've moved to Iceland. I hope so. Because this, this, this every other, every other um, magazine, newspaper, critic, reviewer has praised this book, and it deserves to be praised. And it's, it's interesting that you didn't always want to be a writer, but I can see the social anthropologist in, in it. Um, and um, for writing this book, you did go to Harvard, so you were around the New England patriarchal sort of world. For writing a book about ballet, did you have to do a lot of research? Yeah, I did. I've always been a fan of ballet. Um, I've, my mom would in Orange County, there's a um, performing arts center that gets really excellent ballet companies come through every year. And, and my mom always got season tickets. So starting when I was five or six, I probably saw four or five ballets a year, which sort of adds up until I left when I was 18. Um, but I did have to do a lot of research. And I don't know how anyone wrote anything before YouTube, because <laughs> it is incredibly helpful and especially for something sort of kinetic like ballet um, just any variation in any ballet I want to see there'll be you know 20 different versions of it and I can see most dancers and um, that's allowed me to be really mobile and I've been fairly nomadic for the past two years and spent some time abroad and um, the internet you know, for better or for worse, sort of allowed me to take my research with me. I also carry around like a big hardback ballet reference book. Um, but like the the Royal Ballet in London is especially sort of tech savvy. And so they'll put online an uh, entire company class. So it's an hour and 20 minutes. And you can hear sort of the cadence of how the ballet mistress says, you know, and one and two and heads and up. and. So that sort of thing, just being able to hear it is um, really helpful. But at the same time, I mean, inevitably, there will be mistakes. <laughs> so is there anything else you want to say about technology and 
things like e-readers versus books. Well, I was telling Nancy earlier that um, I, I've had an e-reader for about two months and really enjoyed it, and then I left it on the airplane <laughs> coming out here um, on tour, so now it's a question of if I replace it or not. Um, yeah, it's been interesting having my own e-reader. I've never been... Um, I don't feel any animosity toward them. I think people, whatever form people want to read, you know, I think reading is the thing that matters, is, is a good thing. Um, but then having my own e-reader, I see sort of uh, how I distinguish between books I want an e-form and books I want the actual object of. And, you know, it's, it's incredibly convenient if I'm on the go and I sort of, something occurs to me, I can get it. Um, I was just, I did an artist residency in Ireland in April, and uh, it was in County Kerry, sort of on a cliff overlooking the ocean with some sheep. And so I, would, I had applied for it two years before and thought I would have something I was writing, but as it turned out, I just sent a draft of, of my book back to my editor, so I got there with nothing to do. So I think I read, you know, 12 books in 13 days, and I would drive down into the village and get a Wi-Fi signal and get it on my e-reader. So, I mean, I think it's, it's really kind of cool technology, and, and I think people will continue to read books, you know, at least for a while. <laughs> but. Before we let other people ask you questions, I have a question that um, some people might understand, which is, um, I loved the scene with the whale, and um, did you actually see, I mean, some of us on the island did see a dead whale. There is a dead whale in Maggie's book that is kind of a little bit, I'd say, metaphoric, at least it seems so to me, but it's also a very physical, smelly dead whale. And um, there was a whale I think it was more than a year ago that died out at Surfside, I mean, out at um, Sconset. Did you, have you seen a dead whale? And what do you think of it? <laughs> <laughs> Spectacular. Um, I haven't seen one in the flesh. And when I was here, which was four years ago, a dead pygmy sperm whale washed up. And I actually found out about it a little bit too late, but I was trying to go down to the beach just to get a whiff <laughs> um, voluntarily. Uh, but again, YouTube, very helpful if you YouTube exploding whale. You find some stuff. Um, <laughs> but the, so this whale in, in my book um, is, is dead on the beach and full of gases of decomposition. And I remember reading when I was in high school, there was some little stub article in the LA Times about a scientist who was doing a necropsy on a dead whale and cut into the wrong place at the wrong time and it exploded and it killed him. And he was impaled on a shard of bone. And so this stuck with me for obvious reasons, so horrible. Um, and then when I started expanding seating arrangements into a book, I thought, Oh, I'm sure I'll be able to work an exploding whale in here somewhere. And uh, it turned out it, it worked out. But yeah, it's something that seems to happen. And um, like one of the better YouTubes is uh, a whale that was being transported on a flatbed truck through um, a city in Taiwan and just exploded. And, you know, entire city block was just sort of grimed in whale. Um, <laughs> I really love whales. I saw live sperm whales um, in New Zealand, and I found it incredibly moving. But you know, there's something just so grotesque about them when they're dead, just purely because of their size and kind of confronting and their them. smell. Yeah, their, yeah, their yeah. smell is not great. And finally, I have to ask this: now, I don't know how many of you have read seating arrangements, but there is a character in it named Livia, who is the son. I mean, the daughter of Finn and know of when, and Livia, I really like Livia, and I want you to just say that she gets happily married, and ha <laughs> what happens to Livia? <laughs> yeah, I think she does okay. I think okay. She's, uh, she's sort of the new generation and is forging her own path, so Good. rest easy. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any questions out here from Maggie? 
Yes. Uh, how did you get into the head of your, your main character? Um, I don't know. I don't know if I can really ever explain it sort of satisfactorily. I um, I've known people who have things in common with him. Um, but like I said, I just, I just felt a real affinity for him when I started, and I felt like I understood what he would do or say in most situations. Um, and sometimes, I mean, for me, that's ideally how the plot is formed, just by characters doing what they would really do. So there were times writing it when I would have to sort of stop and, and really purposefully kind of mindfully focus on, you know, trying to put myself in his shoes. But I maybe also made things easier for myself in that he is a very rigid person. <laughs> so he sort of always does the same thing and, and responds in a really um, not a surprising way. So maybe I cheated. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's funny, I'm not, there's no character in the book who's really me. Um, really, if anyone is, it's, it's this character, Dominique, who's sort of the outsider. Um, the father-daughter thing, because, I, because my starting point was Wynn, um, a lot of the decisions I made, just the most basic decisions about the book, came out of a desire to sort of torture Wynn. And so here's someone, he really expected to have sons, and so instead I gave him daughters. And he wants everything to be perfect, and I think, you know, most people planning a wedding, it's so expensive, so much planning goes into it, everyone wants that day to be perfect, and, and he wants this wedding to be perfect, but his daughter's pregnant. Um, so it was a lot of kind of confronting this man with um, uh, female things. I, I'm one of two children, I have an older brother. Um, and my dad is nothing like Wynn, which he would like me to say at all my readings. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I do think, it's funny, you know, the more you write, the more inevitably you sort of expose all your preoccupations to the world. And, and at the time when I was writing uh, seating arrangements or, or revising it, I guess, um, I wrote a short story called Angel Lust, which is, I didn't realize it as I was writing it, but it's almost the same thing. It's, it's a father and two daughters, and sort of this discomfort with the daughter's sexuality and um, what that sort of means for, for the shape of the family as they become adults. So I guess it's somewhere in my subconscious, but my dad probably wouldn't like me to say that. <laughs> That's interesting. I think my sort of conception of Wynn in general is that he's really doing the best he can um, to sort of find a sense of belonging. Like the way I think of him, his whole life is sort of powered by this desire to belong, and that's why he keeps joining these clubs. And he sort of thinks if he can just join the right, this, there's some club out there that'll make him content. And of course, the answer is in his own family. Um, and he has these sort of flashes where, where he feels this real emotion with his daughter. And that's, of course, the answer to everything, but he'll kind of never see it, so. Yes? For this book, I would say not a lot. Um, 
it was more like I, I was saying to Nancy earlier, it was, I guess writing this was in some ways an attempt to kind of find answers just purely by burrowing through my own imagination. Um, and some of it was when I, when I came to Harvard, I, I hadn't really spent any time in the East. Um, I didn't think I really knew what a wasp was. And then I got to school and all of a sudden there are these kids walking around in their whale pants and just like multiple pop collars and I sort of just wondered what it all meant. Like clearly these things were signifying something, um, but it was like a language I didn't speak. And um, so I, I was sort of interested in the way wealth is encoded um, in sort of this, this uber wasp subculture that's in the book versus where I'm from, which is all just like, you get a big shiny car and a big shiny house and everyone knows. Um, <laughs> so I suppose some of my research was um, just reading other sort of literature about this part of the world too. Like I said, I like, I like Cheever and Updike a lot. Um, and so I think in some ways the book was about kind of modernizing that, you know, commuter, raincoat wearing kind of character. But. Sure. Um, I've sort of banished the early drafts from my memory. Like, I can't really reconstruct what all changed, but it was a lot. Um, just for example, one example I can remember um, was that Jack Fenn and his wife, Fee Fenn, who's a ex of Wynn's, um, in my first draft just had nothing to do with each other. And in that first revision, they became a married couple, which is really a small change, but then it just trickles down through the entire book, and you have to change everything, and it's that times 100, um, which is why it took a year pretty much to do. Um, and you know, agents do so much editorial work now because editors are too busy, and um, I really trust my agent as a reader. Um, and so, but so she and I worked on it to the best of our ability, and then you know, the actual editor rolls in, and has lots of other changes and she that was a, a serious learning experience because nobody ever really sat me down and said this is the way everything in publishing works they just sort of you know it just happens to you and so my editor sent me the manuscript in the mail with like a thousand post-it notes in it and some were just like delete this sentence and others were like add a chapter here question mark <laughs> <laughs> which is impossible because that changes, you know, they're sort of short lines within chapters and then the long line of the whole book. Um, and she had made one, like one of her post-its was, the book is Thursday, and then Thursday ended with um, Wynn going to sleep, and then Friday started with him waking up early in the morning. And so she put a little note that was sort of like, we've had too much win, I need a break from him. And this was the one time I called her in the whole process and I was like, Jordan, thank you so much, that's such a great note. Um, problem is that between these two sections where you'd like me to add a different point of view, only three hours elapses and <laughs> all the characters are asleep. <laughs> <laughs> and she just went, hmm. <laughs> And then there is, you know, 45 seconds of silence where I thought she was going to come up with a solution and she was really just waiting me out. And that's kind of when it dawned on me that, oh, her job is to identify the problems and it's my job to fix it, which is kind of great because she doesn't care how I fix it. And that at a chapter, here a note, I approached by taking apart two chapters, rearranging them, adding new sections and making three chapters. So. It wasn't, you know, she's, she said, fine, problem solved, so. But it takes forever, and it's awful. <laughs> <laughs> was there somebody back there I thought I saw a hand? No. Yes. Uh, when you were at KLY, how did British authors respond to both? What sort of questions did they have? Did you have to explain about the wasp? 
Yeah, it, um, sure. Yeah, she was asking, I was just at um, a literary festival in Wales called Hey on Why, which is an amazing festival. I highly recommend going. It's really cool. Um, and then she asked how my book was received in the UK and if the sort of culture of it resonates over there. Um, it was, it's, so it's not out in paperback there yet. It's coming out July 4th and nobody buys hardbacks there <laughs> because they're really expensive. So it's almost like the book hasn't come out in the UK. Um, but it was interesting when we were selling the book because it was a much hotter commodity in the UK than it was in the US and more British publishers wanted it and wanted it with sort of um, a degree of enthusiasm that really puzzled me and, and partly for that reason. But I think there's this sort of, with the, the particular New England culture in the book, there's kind of a mutual fascination with the British aristocracy. And, and I think they get almost a little thrill out of seeing, you know, this American kind of class jockeying and, and uh, um, yeah, I, and, and they, there really seems to be, people seem to know, you know, what, what all this sort of signifies, and which has surprised me. It's been translated into a bunch of languages, and that's always really puzzling to me as well, just what, what an Italian reader would make of this. And I, I run the, um, the ad copy from the translations through Google Translate, and you can tell that they spin it a different way in different countries. And, the Italian ad copy is sort of like sumptuous feasts of wine and lobster, and then the, the French ad copy is like dirty sex with old men. <laughs> so I guess there's, people find what they're looking for in it somehow. Are there any other questions about that? Yes, you had another question? Well, I have a conflictual question, which is whether Nancy Thayer is going to be, has already um, I'll tell you something about age group. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, because when I was talking to Maggie earlier, I said one of the fabulous things about seating arrangements is that it appeals to all ages. And I have a daughter who is 38 years old, and I gave birth to her when I was 10. And uh, <laughs> she, she was the bridesmaid at her best friend's wedding. And so I, I knew that they would love this book. And, um, but I also was kind of worried about it because I thought, I mean, when really is is not the father of the year. I really, I really, boy, he, the, the ugh, uh, no. <laughs> that is my reaction to when. I'm so, and so I said to my daughter, Sam, I said, you know, what, do you, what, what did you think of seating arrangements? And, and I'm, I, I, are you mad at me for saying that you should read it? And how did you feel about when? And, and my daughter said, oh, well, we felt so sorry for him. We felt such compassion for him. We thought there were so many scenes where, where we felt deeply, deeply sorry for him. And I was, I was surprised by that, and it started a dialogue. And I think this is one of the things about a wonderful book about a family, because I love families. This is a very interesting family with characters who are very flawed, some of them more flawed than others. There's the wonderful alcoholic aunt, who I really like, Celeste, who is just a fabulous character. Um, there, there are two sisters uh, uh, and the mother, who loves Wynne, um, surprisingly and well, uh, and, um, and the family works. Um, so I find this book to be such a good starting point for talking to my children about families and what it means. Have you had that sort of reaction from people that all ages respond to your book? Yeah. and. Often in ways that surprise me, like I've been to a few book clubs 
that have talked about it and just people will read it um, and find things in it that I suppose are there but I didn't really you know intend and, and just responses kind of never fail to surprise me like there was one woman who's completely outraged by Biddy and thought Biddy was just so lazy and she was like, what does she even do? Like, Wynne cooks dinner, Wynne does the dishes. She has a wedding planner, she's not even planning the wedding. And it had never occurred to me to think of this character that way. I sort of thought of her as, you know, long-suffering and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I think, I think people will focus on a different kind of corner of, of the family depending on what sort of maybe resonates with their own family. Um, and I think that was part of the appeal. When I, when I set out to write a book about a wedding and set on an island, I, part, this just goes to show how little I knew about publishing. It never occurred to me that it would be like a summer book. And now in retrospect, you know, of course. Um, but I, I really liked how at weddings, the generations are together. And families and friends and people who are total strangers, people who have history, kind of all get group together and drink too much and behave badly. So I think it was, yeah, it was a way of, of getting at a whole family in, in a sort of condensed setting and time frame. Oh. Oh, we're out of time? Oh, all right, we're out of time. Thank you all for coming.